Yeah, how many people know Lisp, by the way? Oh, right, I can skip, no, I can skip four slides in the middle. Never mind, okay. <laughs> so this is about LFE, Lisp flavored Erlang. It's just a, a Lisp, a flavor of Lisp running on top of the Erlang virtual machine. So I just want to describe a little bit, a little bit about that. So to start off with um, what it isn't, it's not Scheme. Okay. It's not Common Lisp, and it's not Clojure. Okay. <laughs> right. and, and the reason for that is the properties of these, or the properties of the Allang virtual machine make implementing those types, those Lisps, inefficient. We'll see why uh, a bit later. So yes, it can be done, but no, it won't be efficient, and there is no way around that. But what is it? Well, it's a proper Lisp. I mean, it's, it's proper in the sense it's not just a weekend hack. It's a proper Lisp with things for it. Um, but it's based on what you can and you can't do on top of the Erlang system. And it means that it will coexist w completely seamlessly with anything else running on the Erlang system, in this case Erlang or OTP. And it runs on a standard VM. There's no special VM necessary for it. So. I can skip the Y Lisp, okay, for the people here. So the question is, of course, do we really want to code in something that is so old? We're, we're talking, uh, for, for what, 50 years now, right? That actually is old, very old Lisp, Lisp code from the early 60s, a copy of it. it. It's three functions doing some set operations on lists, right? So it's a member operation, a union, and an intersection. Um, the syntax wasn't that easy to read, and they hadn't really learned about indentation properly then at that. But we can do it better now, so here are some alternatives written in LFE. There's a union function and intersection function. We'll see more about that. Um, the question of why Lisp, of course, well, it's, if you know it's easy, right? You, you have Lisp has, Lisp has numbers. It's got symbols, right? So we've got more, BERT, more of, do, if, size, and greater than. They're just symbols. We have lists, of course, which is what it's all about. We can have lists of numbers. We can have lists of symbols. And we can have lists of... Um, lists containing both numbers and symbols. Um, we can have another list here, which is starting to get interesting here, because this is, well, it's a list of the greater than of a size and four, right? This is also a list. And now it's just, we're starting to see here that we're actually getting code. So this is an if, this is an if, um, well, an if form. We have test if something size is greater than four, we'll do bump it, otherwise we'll call drop it, right? Which means if we go even further, we can have a define a function like this, which is also a list. So the, one of the very interesting things about Lisp, of course, is that all code is just lists. All codes are, data, are just data straight off data structures. It's homo iconic, which means working with code very easy compared to working with code with other languages. It also means that, well, depending how you want to see it, Lisp has a very simple, very simple syntax or it has no syntax at all. I write down the list and I can interpret that as pretty much whatever I want to interpret it as, right? For it. And of course the why, the why Lisp here, well, it's been around, a lot has changed since 58, okay, yes. But it's, it's an excellent language, excellent language for experimenting, prototyping, developing systems, um, writing things like DSLs in Lisp, they're actually nothing specific because we can view a whole of Lisp as a DSL. Right? So that's a very quick thing. Most people have seen it. Okay, what's the goal of LFE? What was the goal of it? It was to be a proper Lisp. I mean, something that's actually usable to, to, to write serious stuff in, and it, and it is. Um, it hasn't reached 1.0, but it's, it is production quality, actually. There's always one more feature I want to add before I get to 1.0 for it. But pretty soon I will have reached it. It's efficient on the beam, meaning in the sense that you, if you, you can write your code in LFE and it will be as fast as writing it in Erlang or anything else on the VM. There's nothing strange about that. And it interacts seamlessly with Erlang and OTP. So you can mix, you can write things in Erlang, you can write things in Lisp, you can mix them together. Um, if you're using OTP, I can write my behaviors in LFE. There's no problems doing that. So, so how does this work in a more general sense here? Um, yeah, this, all due respect to Leonard Cohen here. This is a fantastic Leonard Cohen CD, if you haven't heard it. 
It's from the early 70s, but it's really well worth li listening to. It's as, as, it is as depressing as they always are, but it's very nice depressing, right? <laughs> There's even death in it, right? It's okay, yes. But it's the, it's the idea of here, it's the new skin for the old ceremony. And get, what do I mean by this is, if you start looking at implementing languages, other languages on top of the Erlang virtual machine, you end, up, you end up with something like this if you're going to do it sensibly. You've got the Erlang virtual machine, the beam at the bottom. Okay. You have Erlang on top of that. Then you have the OTP libraries, and then you put what you're, what you're doing, in this case LFE, sort of half beside, half on top and half beside it. So you, 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 you could implement it directly on the beam, but that would be a very impractical choice because you'd be throwing away most of the benefit, a lot of the benefits you get, from, which are part of the Erlang system, the OTP, the libraries, the way of working with it, you just throw that away. So a better way of doing that is keeping those and putting what you want to do beside it and on top of it so I can reach all the good stuff for it. I can reach the good stuff that's in Erlang and in OTP, but I, I do it through my, my interface. And this is how you would implement a, a language, I would, I would say a native language on top of the Erlang virtual machine. I mean, this is basically what Erlang is. And if you're looking at Elixir, they do it exactly the same way. There's nothing strange about this. So the, the first question is, of course, what is the beam? Because this, this decides, this defines exactly what we can and we can't do, right? And so what is the beam? Well, it's a virtual machine to run Erlang. Okay, sort of a, a bit of a duh, but uh, <laughs> this, actually, this actually means quite a lot for it because when you think about it, um, the beam is designed to implement Erlang. Nothing else, just Erlang. So there's very close connection about the features of the Erlang language and the beam and the features of this, how systems would be built on top of Erlang and how that's supported inside the beam. So there's a very close connection between them. So the thing here is saying um, to make it efficient, if you want to make it efficient, you have to work with that and accept, accept that and work with that and use, the, use those features. Right? And if you look at the properties of the beam, I missed a slide. Oh, great. Never mind. Yeah, OK. So there was a slide missing here, um, talking a bit about, about the more system-type features of Beam. So the, the, all the things that you get in Erlang, like the, concur the primitives for the concurrency, like the primitives for the fault tolerance, the communication, the process handling, the distribution mechanisms, the scalability stuff, all that's part of the Beam. All that's based in there. So when you're running Erlang and you're running it on two cores or four cores or eight cores or 16 cores or however it might be, it's the beam that makes sure you get access to all of them. It's the beam that will load balance automatically between systems. It'll make it efficient to send things, messages between processes. Everything like this is all part of the beam. All that's baked in. You get all that for free. But there are things you seldom see directly in your language. You will use them because you know I have processes. I know I can send messages. I know, for example, the system will never block, et cetera, and all these type of things. I know everything's asynchronous, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't see that in my language, really. It's just there, right? And I will use it, and I will use it when building systems. I don't see it. But here are some properties, but some of the properties of the beam are directly related to Erlang, the language, and these are what will affect me as implementing a language on top of the system. Directly affect, which this is what I see, right? And coming from a functional world, some of these aren't strange at all, but if, you, if you're not, they can be. So it's immutable data, okay? Again, this is very functional, but all data is immutable. There is no way of getting around that. It's not that, there's, there's, it's not that the language itself enforces, it, it's the implementation of the virtual machine that does it. There is only a predefined set of data types. That's it. I cannot create new data types. Uh, but we have support for pattern matching built into the language. So that's, that's very nice for it. Uh, support for a functional language. The way modules and code work are also baked into the system for it. And another one which can be slightly strange if you're coming from the non-functional world is there is no global data in the Erlang machine at all. We don't do global and we don't do sharing. And that's it, right? Now, these are things that will directly affect imp you implementing a language. 
And this is what I was getting at earlier, things like common lisp and scheme, you cannot make an efficient implementation of those because you don't have mutable data. So if you want to implement mutable data, that, me that entails carrying around a state with all the data in it and working on that state when you're mutating it. And yes, you can do it. I've done it with, for a Lua, but it is not efficient. So you can't get that. And there is no way around that. So yeah. And this, if, this affects the language. So some of the things we're going to look at, we won't go through everything, but all the features of LFE, but some parts of it. Um, it's a bit about the syntax, the data types, modules, functions. Lisp 1 versus Lisp 2, the never-ending war. A bit about pattern matching and macros. Right? So, so the syntax is pretty straightforward, basic Lisp syntax. You have your parentheses for, for the lists. Um, some bits were borrowed from Scheme, so that it's got the square bracket versions of list, lists instead. Um, symbols, quoted symbols, they're like common Lisp. You've got vertical bar quoting those. We have all the standard separators. Um, we have the we have this tuple constants. We've got binary constants. Uh, there's a string syntax which expands to lists of lists of characters, lists of integers, and this is the way Erlang does it. So if you look inside the Erlang system, there, Erlang doesn't really have strings. It has lists of uh, list, lists of um, code point values. So the string expands to that. We've got characters. There is also a bit of syntax for a binary string. So you can, you can make a binary, a binary, data, binary data structure which contains a UTF-8 encoded character streams. Okay. We have a fixed set of data types. Again, this is what's enforced by the Erlang virtual machine. The Erlang virtual machine does not allow you to, to no user-defined data types at all. Um, it has to do with the code loading. If anyone wants to talk more about it afterwards, I can explain. But. So we have numbers, we have atoms, which are Lisp symbols. Uh, we have lists, of course. We have tuples, which are equivalent to Lisp vectors. We have maps. Uh, we have binaries. And we have a number of opaque data types that you just, they're just there. For example, you have a process. Each process has a process identifier, which uniquely identifies that process, typically called a PID, and that's its own data type. There are a few others as well, too, for it. And that's what you have. That's it, right? Um, many, there are a number of things here which means we can't do things like it's done in common lisp or in scheme. For example, when we're talking about atoms and symbols, in Erlang, an atom only ha it has one property and that's its name. There is no concept of an atom having a value or a property list or something like that. That just, just does not exist um, in the system at all. It has an, an atom knows its name, that's basically it. And the value of an atom is itself. There's only one namespace. We don't have namespaces in the system. Okay. We can't implement common list packages as they are because they are namespaces. We can't do that. You could fake it by munging names. So ha having an exported uh, a visible at symbol in a comp package, you could call that foo colon bar and in in internal one foo, uh, foo colon colon bar or something like that. But that will just not, won't properly work, right? You could more, more almost get it working, but then you won't be able to interact with the rest of the Erlang system, which has other rules as well too. So that, that just doesn't work, right? So we don't have packages. Um, that means we have a problem with all the other language lists I was mentioning. We can't do those properly. Booleans are atoms. This is just an Erlang property. So the, the atoms, true or false, they're the Boolean values. There's no special, no Boolean types. So I'm not going to talk about the other, other data types. They're pretty straightforward. I mean, numbers are numbers, tuples are tuples, and things like this. The interesting one, of course, are binaries, which um, in one's one sense, binary is extremely boring. It's it's an it's an array date. It's an array, it's an array of bytes. Okay, that's it. The interesting thing is how you can access it. Um, so I have a structure here, binary. The, the top one, the first one, constructs a binary of three bytes, one, two, and three. But I can uh, so I construct with segments, but I can say what I want these segments to be. So the second binary. Um, I'm creating a binary with T, and, it's, and it's, it's going to be 16 bits big and, and a little endian value. 
little en Indian integer put in that, right? And then I've got two, two segments which are four bits big each. And um, I've got a floating point, which is a 32-bit floating point, and I'm putting a bit string at the end of it. Now, a bit string can be any number of bits. They don't have to be units of eight for it. So this tells me how I want to put together my binary. So it's a very declarative way of accessing raw, raw byte data. I don't say how, I don't give instructions how to do it. I say, what do I want it to look like? And if I write this structure down, the system will build that binary for me according to those rules and putting those fields in. That's a very powerful way of working with, with binaries, with, with binary data. It means things like protocols suddenly become extremely simple. I basically look up in Wikipedia the description of the protocol structures and I write down the binary definitions of them, and that's it. I can do these things for it. And as an example of um, push this back a bit, how far you can get, that binary structure describes an IP version 4 packet in one go, right? So yeah, it's a, it's a four bit version. It's a, uh, it's a four bit to header length. It's a it's eight bit service type. It's a 16 bit total length. It's a 16 bit ID. There are three flag bits there, which I think are usually zero for the ty least types I've looked at them there. There's a 13 bit fragment offset, an eight bit time to live, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just, I write this down, this will create the, that binary packet for me, right? So it's a very nice declarative way of um, working with, with um, binary data. And I'm actually very surprised that a lot of other languages don't have this. I mean, it, it, writing that in C code, that's quite a lot of effort and it's quite a lot of errors, and here it's just straight off, right? We'll see some other examples, of that, uh, other things you can do with that later on as well, too, for it. So, Erlang has this concept of records. If you were, when I was talking yesterday, someone was asking you about records. So we have records, of course, in LFE, the mainly just because we want to, be a, want to be able to interface to our language has the records, so we want a nice structure for that. But again, it's not a new data type, okay? It, it's a tuple with a tag at the front of it. This is, this is how our lang records look internally as well. It's just a tuple with a tag with the record name at the front of it. And um, it provides name fields. That's all it does. Right? So, for example, down here, we, we would have a person record here with me in it and um, my name, age, and some interests, a list of interests for it. And this is just basically how it's literally how it's, into, it's um, in, stored in the system. It's just a tuple. And we can have a long discussion of why that was good or bad, but that's another issue here. But we have a pretty lispy way of defining it. So we have a def, def record macro here, which takes the name of the record and then all the fields you want to put in it, and it will make what that... A field definition can just be the field name or a field name and a default value. Now, what that will produce is a sequence of macros to create and access that record. So if I define a record like this, I'll get a, I'll get a, make, um, a make macro, which will create a record, to record for me. I'll get a test for it. I'll get a match, one I can use when pattern matching, so I can test, is, is this thing, this type of record, and extract fields, et cetera, for it. I'll get access records, or access macros for accessing the fields in, so I can set them or read them. So we have, have a, we have a case here with which one macro, which when, when I call that will expand to a sequence of other macros I can use for it. So records are very easy to use um, from LFE. Okay. We have modules and functions. So again, we have what the Erlang system, what the Beam provides uh, with modules. They are very basic. Okay, um, a module, it has a name, it has a list of exported functions, um, it can only contain functions. Okay, there is no concept of modules having data or anything like this, there are no module variables or module data structures or anything like this. It, 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 at the bottom level, it's, it, it's a name, it's a list of exported functions and it's a lot of defined functions inside it, that's it, right? And the module namespace is flat. There is no hierarchical module namespace in the language in the system at all. You can try and put something on top of it, but at the low level, it's just flat, right? And the thing here with modules is they're the unit of code handling. 
So when you compile something, you compile a whole module. When you load something, you load a whole module. When you get rid of something, you, you delete the whole module. You cannot compile bits. You cannot have bits and pieces of functions. I, I'll compile a few functions here in one module and have a, have a function over here which I'll compile and put into that module. That does not work. When you compile the module, you have to compile the whole module in one go. That makes some things you'll find in other lists a bit difficult. It's, they're not equivalent to a namespace. I can't create a namespace. With a namespace, I can create the namespace and I can add things to it later. I cannot do that with a module. When I make the module, everything has to be there. That makes other things difficult to do. And also, just we have functions only exist in modules. So now we're seeing from the, from the list point of view, now getting a brief overview of the internals of Erlang as well, too. So two, two for the price of one presentation here. So yeah, functions only exist in modules. Um, the LFE REPL, you can define functions locally within that as well, too. And another interesting thing here with modules, there are no interdependencies between modules. So anything, any interdependencies, they're there all run, done at runtime. Um, I cannot at compile time check if a module exists or not safely check if a module exists or it has a function or anything like this. So I, I do not know what it'll actually be like when I'm running. Um, the reason for this is that, it, from the Allen point of view, modules can come and go while the system is running. And if you have things like interdependencies and stuff, that will make, seriously impede on that. That's why you cannot have user-defined data types, because, because, because modules can come and go while they're doing that. So yeah, this is just some very basic pop. And these are just things you have to live with. Yes, I'll very much like to be able to have more namespace type module. I could plug in and remove functions as I go later on, but the system does not allow that. You could do it perhaps by keeping all the abstract code of all the functions in the module and recompiling things as you go all the time when you're adding and removing stuff, but that will affect how the code handling of the system runs and, and, and affect other things while the system is going, so you, you can't do that. So just how to define a module. I, there's a def module. So this defines the modular rith, and we're saying we're exporting two functions. We're exporting three functions here, actually, add two, add three, and sub two. So what are the twos, threes here? So when, um, in Erlang, a function has a name and it has a number of arguments, the arity of the function. So when I'm, what I'm saying here is I'm exporting add with two arguments and I'm exporting add with three arguments and I'm exporting sub with two arguments. And again, this, 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 is, this is the underlying Erlang machine. There's nothing I can do about this. So every, so that, it means two things, that I can have um, a func two functions with the same name with different number of arguments and they're different functions. So if you look in this code here, there are two add functions. There's an add AB which does plus AB and there's add ABC which does plus ABC. And they are different functions. They have the same name but they're different functions. And when I want to export them as I do here, I have to be explicit and say which ones I want to export. And we have sub here with two arguments for it. Uh, it also means you cannot have functions with variable number of arguments. You can try and, you can try and fake it, but the, you can't do that internally. That's just a property of the system that's baked into that. And again, this is something we just have to um, uh, accept. This is how it works, right? So yeah. So having f functions with the same name and multiple arguments is quite practical. It's quite nice to do that. Um, not having functions with variable number of arguments, well, if you're used to it, it can be quite stifling, but you, you get around that. There are ways around that, anyway. So, yeah. So, an LFE module, it, it, it's a declaration. It's the thing at the top, the def, def module. Well, you, there, there are other declarations you can put in there as well. For it, but instead of declarations, it has function definitions. These were the functions I was defining before, the, ad, the two adds and the sub, for example. Um, well, I can define macros inside a module, and I can access those. And um, there's a way of, do, there's a way of, uh, of doing compile time uh, function definitions. So for example, the def, the def record macro, that expands to a number of macros plus two internal local functions, which are used when you're do, doing the macro expansions. And they're compile time functions. They only exist during the compile time. They're not, not seen afterwards. But they're used when, for the macro expansion. 
And there are other things you can do there now. You can actually do quite a lot there now in the comp at the compile time level of defining things, defining macros, defining functions which are used by macro expansions and stuff like this, and defining variables that only compile time and stuff like this. For but once, they, once the module's compiled, it's all gone. Um, macros can be defined anywhere just as long as they're defined before they're used. There's nothing strange about that. Okay. I'll be working on extending this. I'll talk a bit more about this at the end. Hopefully I've got the right slide here as well too. Okay, the Lisp 1 versus Lisp 2. Um, this is the discussion that's been going on, what, 50 years, um, about these type of things for it. And um, this is how symbols, if they're in the function position or in the value position, how, how you get the value from them, put this way. So if, um, if, you, look at the, if you look at the foo42 the foo bar list there, that's, that's, a, that's calling the function foo, with value 42 and the value of the, of the, of the symbol bar. Okay. That's, what that, that's what that structure does. Now, if you're in a Lisp 1 um, Lisp, then in both positions, both the foo and the function position there and bar and the value position, you will use the value cell for that symbol to get, get the thing. So you'll get the, take the value cell of foo for the function and take the value cell of bar as the argument. So that's what Lisp 1 means. It's just one thing that's a value cell. Now, if you're in Lisp 2, then a symbol will have a value cell and it will have a function cell. Okay, so that's where the 2 comes from. And therefore, the foo here, which is, in the, which is the function name, that will use the value of the function cell for the function, whereas bar will use the value of the value cell as the value. Does that make sense? Yeah. And... Um, so, typical Lisp 1 scheme is a Lisp 1. I think closure is a Lisp 1. And typical uh, Lisp 2, common Lisp is a Lisp 2. Okay. And all Mac Lisp and Lisp Machine Lisp, they were also Lisp 2. Actually, there are, there are a lot... It should be... It's not really Lisp 1, Lisp 2. It should be Lisp 4 or Lisp 5 or something like this because a symbol can have other properties as well. But that's, that's what this war has been... This goes on here. So that's the Lisp 1 versus the Lisp 2. Um... Generally, Lisp 1 is said to be cleaner. It's nice so forth. You just have one thing, and you use that irrespective of what you're going to do with it. But we have Lisp 2s. I think, I read, reading some of they actually wanted to make a Lisp 1 out of common Lisp, but they couldn't because of the, the, um, the, the heredity from it. Behind it. So, yeah, how does this work? Now, how are we going to fit this into, into um, LFE? So I can, I can um, define two functions foo here. One of one argument and... One of two arguments, sorry, and one of three arguments. So I've got two, I can have, at a sort of global level, I can have two foos. Now, if, if I was in a list one here, I would, in my bar here, I'd do a let here, and I'd say ba baz now is a, is, is a lisp, is a function of one argument, and I could call it with baz z here, and I could call foo with two arguments and foo with three arguments there. I could not read, I could not have two bazes in this case, one of one argument and one of two arguments. Because they're just, they're just the value of that symbol. Whereas in foo here, I can have multiple foos because that's what the system gives me. Okay. And this is inconsistent. Okay. What, why should I only have allowed to have one baz but two foos? Because they're in different places. Now, one solution would be to say, okay, we'll cut out this thing about having, multiple, have having functions of d different number of arguments. We'll just, just forbid that. We could do that quite easily. Um, but that's very restrictive, and it also would affect... Um, your interaction with the rest of Erlang and OTP, which more or less assumes you have these, you have functions the same name and multiple arguments. And I don't like the inconsistency. So those heard me yesterday say, yesterday say consistent, consistent, consistent. So the alternative is that you go for Lisp two instead, interpretation of it. So I can still have my two functions um, foo there, but I can I can now I can now define functions baz depending on, like have multiple definitions of baz depending on how many arguments they have. So I can't do a normal let here, I have to do an f let, a function let here, saying, okay, now I'm defining baz, the functions baz here with two, two of them, one of one argument, one of two arguments. And I can use these locally so I can call ba foo with two arguments, foo with three arguments, baz with one argument, baz with two arguments. So, so I, I'm, I'm being consistent. 
I can also actually give baz a value inside a let and use that as well too if I want to. So it's, it is consistent here. And um, that's why I went with Lisp2, because of the consistency for, for it. I just found it easy to work with. So yeah. So I think it fits better into the system. I think it just makes the whole thing more consistent. Um, I actually call Lisp2+, plus because you can not just have multiple fu two functions, you can have multiple functions of them. So I can, as you saw, I have multiple foos and I have mul multiple bazes as well too. Okay, so that, that's that. that. That's why we ended up there. Um, there are a few other Lisps on top of the Allang machine, one called Joxa. They went with Lisp1 instead. That they, they are more closure inspired. Um, yeah, as you might have seen if you've seen common list, this is, this is more common list inspired in many of the names of the, of the things you're doing there for it. We have pattern matching. Okay, I don't have to sell pattern matching here. Yes, it's a fantastic big win. Um, once you've used it, you'll sort of realize, you'll sort of wonder how you could not have it. I was seeing, saw some discussion on Twitter that C++ is considering um, getting patterns or something like that equivalent to it. I don't know if it's true or not. To just some question, someone asked what, what, what people th thought about that idea. I have absolutely no idea if it works or not, if you can fit it in, but it'd be fantastic if you could do it. Is anyone? Nope, another, another environment, another world. Yeah, so we have pattern matching, of course. We put pat pattern matching every, everywhere. Do I go too far there? Yeah. So we, um, so we use pattern matching. This is a change from, from LFE compared to most other lists. We, we have pattern matching built into the system everywhere, right? So it's in the function clauses, let's case receives, macros, macro cons, LC and BC, list, list comprehensions and binary comprehensions. So the let now is not a, just a value, it's a pattern. So I give a pattern and an expression, I evaluate that expression, I do the bindings and they're the variables I can ex export out for it. Uh, we have a case, we have a case and expression with separate clauses depending on which pattern matches. So we use pattern matching everywhere. The only one we'd actually have to have is the receive, because this is the structure that's used in the Allang system to extract, to get messages that have been sent to a process. And you do that by using patterns, saying which message do I want, I'll give a pattern to a message I want to receive, and I'll find that message. So here we'd actually have to have patterns, or we'll have the trivial case of receiving everything, which is something you don't want. So we do pattern matching for it. Um, when you define a function, you can define a function with separate clauses and use patterns on the arguments to say, um, to, to select clauses. Okay, so, so, I, uh, so I can function with multiple clauses depending on the arguments, the, the patterns, and the arguments I can select clauses, I can select clauses which one I want to do here. We've even added a pattern case to the cond. So con just doesn't do tests, one of the tests can actually be a pattern match. If that pattern match exceeds, then you choose that, choose that case. And then, then the variables that come out of the pattern match you can use in the body there. So we've tried to put pattern matching as, as deeply as possible into the system. Um, there are list, list comprehensions and binary comprehensions, um, macros as well, which you also use patterns for selecting as well. We have macros, of course. I mean, you could not have a list without macros. Um, they're unhygienic for it. There is basically no gen sim. Well, you can write a gen sim, but then you run into a problem in Erlang that uh, whenever you create an atom, it never goes away and you'll eventually fill the atom table if you do that uh, in uncontrolled fashion, so we don't do that. And at, there, at, the, at the moment, they're only compiled time, though within the REPL, you can define local macros there and use them as well too. So the, rep, the REPL is very dynamic, right? And um, there are a bunch of core forms <coughs> in LFE. You cannot redefine those as macros. I mean, there's a cons core, core form for building a con structure. Yes, you can define a macro called cons, but it'll never be called. So it's, there's a bit of self-protection anyway. You, can't, you, you can shoot yourself, but not too much anyway, right? <laughs> so yes. But the system quite happily defines the macro for you, but you just won't, it won't read it. There's a def, so there's a def macro here, so I'm defining a macro add then, which takes two and just returns, a, just returns a, an expression that, which does the plus. 
Uh, we have a macro at the average, um, which returns a division by the sum of all the arguments divided by the length of the arguments here. And arguments is a list here. And what will happen here is the length will be calculated compile time, but whereas the average will just become a, um, a call to the plus function to sum them all together, which will be done at runtime. And um, we can have multiple clauses in, in, in macros as well, depending on the structure here, so we can define a list, list star macro here. This is the common list, list star macro. Yeah. And macros can take any number of arguments. Okay. So there's, one, there's only one macro foo. And they can take as many arguments as you want to call with it, and at macro expansion time, you can decide how, many how you want to handle a different number of arguments. Um, yeah, can multiple clauses. And we have the back quote macro which is fantastic because it allows us to write down what the structure. One problem with Lisp is often you have to, you have to, it's, you have to, you don't write down the structure, you write down a set of instructions for building, a set of forms for building the instructions. With a back quote macro, you can write down the structure and it will generate the forms here. So for example, the, the plus, a, the back quote plus AB here will generate, will generate a set of instructions that builds that list when you run it. But I can write down what I want the list to look like, which is great. Uh, we don't have time for the code example, I'm afraid. Um, we almost talk afterwards, we can do that. So some ongoing work here. Um, so now if you define a macro, you have to define a macro local to the module you're compiling it in, which means if you want to share macros, you put them in an include file, and you include that file in, multi in all the modules you want. So what I'm working now on, which I actually have working, is a way you can define macros in one module and export them from that module and then you can call them from another module in the same way as you call a function call here. So I can call, if, I, if I've got the mod here with a macro, I can do mod colon macro. That will call that macro at compile time and expand it. So I don't, I, don't have to, I don't have to include the macro definitions locally. I can still do it if I want to, of course, but I don't have to. Um, so that works, that works well now for compile time. I even have a version working for runtime expansions of it, but I'm not really certain I want to include that. It's, um, it's quite limited, but it works. But I don't know. We'll see where we end up. Um, I have an implementation of Lisp machine flavors. Now, that was a precursor to, to the common Lisp object system. And I think it's a lot, lot, lot more fun than, than, than the close one for it. So I have an, I have, I have an implementation of that. I can't, you can't implement all of it, because a lot of it's, a lot of it's very co Lisp machine specific, so you can't do those bits. But I have, I have the basic stuff there. Um, it works. They have a lot of cool properties. They've got demons and things like this you can call at various stages. You can mix, you can merge all the stuff together. It's, it's quite a lot of fun, actually. It's, um, yeah. Um, work is being done on a closure interface. I'm not doing it myself. Another guy, Duncan McGregor, has been doing that. So we had a talk between, between an Alang system running LFE and a, and a JVM running closure in a relatively nice way between them for him as well, too. Another thing I'm going to start working on is, well, the structs that came from the Lisp machine. Um, they, they will subsume records. And what, what, they, what they have is they, they have a very versatile formatting and access way of specifying formatting and accessing. So it won't just be locked tuples or tag tuples and things like this. I can say I want, I want the access functions or access macros in a module and stuff like this for them. Um, a lot of control over that. And it will subsume records. Records just to be a special case of this. And also actually um, be able to define Elixir structs from that. So they're, they're quite easy to define that. They're using maps, but the same, same idea for it. So we'll be able to define that to, to, to interface that. So this is stuff that's coming now. Uh, one feature we have, I haven't mentioned here, we have multi-module files. So you can define, define many modules in one <coughs> file if you want to. So the final question is for you kick me up, <laughs> is um, why? Well, I like Lisp. That's easy. Lisp was the first high-level language I learned. It's still fantastic. Um, I, like, I like Alang, of course. I like the way this, how Alang works with systems. I actually like the language. Um, I like to implement languages. I think that's fun. So doing LFE was natural. Okay. I've got other language implementations I can bore you with later if someone asks. And that's about it. So that's me. Uh, yeah, th this, is, this is not nothing really to do with Alang solutions. So, so they're not, 
I have sort of had tacit support for doing it, but it's not part of the Alang Solutions work. So that's sort of my private programming email address. And Arverding's the tag. Um, LFEIO is, is uh, the web page for, for this, and the GitHub ones are where you can find the source code. And there's a, there's a uh, Google group for a mailing list, and there's a tag, Twitter tag out on list for talking about it. That's about it. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Maybe for one or two short questions. Yep. Any questions? Okay. Is there in uh, LFE uh, some kind of uh, polymorphism to, to define different behavior depending on the shape of the data? Well, I, I, I can do that in a normal function definition. I can say, yes, I've got the function foo here, and if, and if the argument is a is number, do this. If it's a structure, do that. If it's a list, do that. I can do that. That's can you extend it later? No. That's, that's a problem of the module handling. Once I've compiled and made the module, I cannot extend or change things. That's a, a limitation, yes. Um, I saw that you can do um, more than two arguments with a plus. Does that mean plus was implemented as a macro? Yep. Plus is a macro. It's very lispy internally. There's a quite a small number of core forms, and a lot of things are macros. Everything, basically everything I've shown here is a macro. Right. <laughs> For, yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, what's the interop story? I mean... <coughs> The thing that made Clojure successful, I think, is great interop with both uh, JavaScript and JVM. So are you, can you call like Erlang functions by name? Yeah. You, right. uh, the, so the no Erlang glue code, right? Pardon? No, no any glue code or... or nope. Okay. You call the Erlang functions straight off. The Erlang functions can call you straight off. So if I want to use OTP behaviors, I can write my behavior modules in, in LFE and I just call the functions the same name. The only slightly... I don't know if it's messy, but is that being a Lisper, you want to use a hyphen to, to separate words. Being an Erlang, you have to use underscore, and which doesn't feel that nice. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a number of solutions that haven't been able to work out a good one that I like for that. Yeah. Oh. Just yeah. Is that a more interactive way of exploring kind of Erlang and trying new things? Is it more interactive than a standard Erlang? The, the shell is more interactive, in the fact that you can define you can define functions you can define functions and macros in the shell and, and experiment to work with them there. Right, that that is. Um, as I said, you can't get past the basic properties of the Erlang system. Not, not as soon as you start compiling things, anyway. Uh, can we have uh, mixed language projects right now? So mixed yeah. Erlang project and uh, yeah, no worries. Is there, is there is a tooling for that right now? You don't actually don't need a tooling. Uh, in the sense that they, when I'm calling, I'm calling one from the other. When, I, when I'm calling a module from Erlang, I don't have to know what, what it's written in. I just call it the same thing going back the other way. Um, there is support in Rebar 2 for compiling LFE modules, and Rebar 3 will just need a plug-in for it to do that. So you, you can run them together. The own. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the questions, but we don't have time for yep. any more of them. And let's thank our speaker. Okay. Thank you.